I am a trained professional scientist who has spent the last six years of my life searching for Bigfoot. Now, I know, I know, that sounds like an oxymoron, right? Like Fox News searching for the truth. But is it an oxymoron? Because I'm not so sure anymore. Now, if you guys have never seen my TV show, it's like a real-life X-Files, where I'm Scully, but with three molders. <laughs> my co-hosts are three men who adamantly believe Bigfoot is real, and they're regularly exasperated that I'm not swayed by what they consider hard evidence. And as the only member of the team with a degree in biological science, my standard for proof is a wee bit higher. But despite these differences, we still make it work. Now, you're all probably wondering, why am I willing to be on a TV show about something in which I don't believe, and for which there's no proof? Why would I endure traipsing the globe through extreme weather, battling mosquitoes, leeches, ticks, limited to poultry food options, and confined in an SUV for countless hours with my Bigfoot-hugging co-hosts? Believe me, guys, I am frequently asking myself these questions. But what, what defines me and what keeps me going, the answer, is something that has driven me all my life, curiosity. And curiosity is at the core of scientific inquiry. Because in my life, you guys have to understand, I had my own version of Bigfoot. My father. He was a larger-than-life figure, literally. You could take a quarter and drop it through his wedding ring. And our special bond was stories about Bigfoot. My father challenged me about the unknown. He didn't tell me what to think. He asked me what I thought. I have him to thank for my fascination with Bigfoot, the unknown, and enriching my young, curious mind. And that's the reason I originally began this journey. But to be honest, the reason I've stayed on it is the kids that I've met while filming the show. Kids who, with a look of wonder in their eyes, cannot wait to search for Bigfoot. And knowing that these kids are inspired by the possibility of Bigfoot, that they're motivated to unplug and get outdoors and discover nature for themselves, that's what keeps me going. Because these junior future naturalists they're my pride and joy. And to be blunt, if it weren't for these kids, I could not sustain myself on this crazy circus sideshow. <laughs> I'm grateful to Bigfoot for feeding their curiosity. Now, somewhere along the way in becoming an adult, I, I held dear to the words of Carl Sagan. Every kid starts out as a natural-born scientist, and then we beat it out of them. But a few trickle through the system with their wonder and enthusiasm intact. So what's happened to us, guys? How do we go from kids always asking questions to jaded cynics assuming we have all the answers? Why don't we all believe in Bigfoot? I love the idea of Bigfoot. I'm fascinated by the phenomena. And that's not in spite of the fact that I'm a scientist. It's the reason I'm a scientist. See, that wonder and curiosity that my father nurtured in me, it led me to the path of science and field research. It shaped the way that I view the world. Because despite what we once thought, we won't fall off the edge of the Earth. And that's not a flaming chariot up in the sky keeping us warm, and walls don't keep people out of countries. None of that is changed by how many memes to the contrary are shared on Facebook. <laughs> but even still, while I'm always skeptical, I'm never cynical. And as a left-handed environmental activist, out lesbian and woman in science, I'm accustomed to being an outsider, and I've developed a, a warrior grit and fortitude. But I've also learned that when sharing my perspective with others, a gracious approach helps helps us remove those obstacles to a sincere conversation. But we still need to acknowledge, you're not always going to get an answer.
but rest in the fact that you can learn something along the way. But I need you to understand, the reality of my reality TV experience is not so much finding Bigfoot as it is finding people who claim to have found Bigfoot. <laughs> I cannot cross the boundaries of a Cabela's, Walmart, small town pub for that matter, <laughs> without being approached by someone who professes to have had an encounter. And again and again, I'm placed in this precarious position where I interview witnesses with profound emotion, swear they saw a hairy eight-foot biped run off with their dog, goat, wife, what have you. <laughs> but it's curiosity that propels me to understand what really happened to them. Now, mind you, I don't believe Bigfoot's a biological undiscovered species running amok in the woods any more than I believe that creak in the floorboard in the middle of the night is your deceased relatives gathered around to watch you sleep. But what surprises me most is after each investigation, the definite connection I make with the witnesses, despite that in every case, Bigfoot's eluded us yet again. One thing I have discovered through my show is there are a lot of people that believe in Bigfoot. And many of these folks will go to great lengths to try to convince you to believe the way that they do. They believe it, but they want you to believe it too. Does sound familiar, folks? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if curiosity led us to want to discover the truth, regardless of how we feel? But instead, these days, it seems everyone has their own opinion and their own version of proof, and they will fight passionately for and against it. Each of these conversations has the potential to devolve into an argument. And <laughs> We see the differences of opinion all around us, exactly, you know. There's our politics, climate change, LGBTQ equality. If Bigfoot is real, you guys, and has observed the way that people conduct themselves, I wouldn't blame it for staying out of sight, because I'd sure as hell stay hidden, too. <laughs> so how do we find balance between your beliefs and another's without belittling and making the other side feel ridiculous? I mean, have we become so polarized, we can't even have a conversation anymore? As vehemently as these Bigfoot believers cling to its existence, I cling to the belief, the idea, that the power of curiosity can motivate us to gracefully debate. But I'm still curious, guys. I have to wonder, where did the folks who believe a massive furry man-ape has run around the woods stray from real science? As desperately as these believers want to know that it's real, they can't prove it. And since they can't prove it, they'll go to great lengths to insist you're wrong. <laughs> they use opinions as fact ad nauseum, and I've heard them all. They're smarter than us. They bury their dead. They're aliens. They taught Elvis how to hide and they never have definitive scientific proof. My dog ran off with the bones. I lost the hair sample. The batteries in the camera were bad. My brother's uncle's cousin's plumber doesn't want the attention. These folks are more proven to deliver their point than they are to solve the mystery. Now, if Bigfoot's not real, I'm curious, well, what are these witnesses experiencing? As a scientist, that's what I want to know. Because thousands of people per year report seeing a Bigfoot. And of course, <laughs> I firmly believe there are biological and psychological explanations for these reports. And after interviewing countless witnesses, I've conducted my own pseudoscientific survey. And I've created a chart with categories to better explain the phenomena. Now, in my opinion, I believe that the majority of the reports can be identified as misidentification, such as mistaking a beaver for a Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this, this recently happened in New Mexico, you guys. I know because I was there. Not only do bears and hikers get confused for Bigfoot, but I'm telling you, in the wrong perspective, a sketchy squirrel can look menacing. Now, 
the next category I, I call pareidolia, which is a psychological phenomenon where one perceives meaningful, meaningful images in, in, in these random patterns. Essentially, you see a face on the surface of Mars, or Jesus on a dog's butt. <laughs> Mother Teresa on a cinnamon bun. Or a comforting, familiar face on toast. <laughs> Essentially, we're talking about Bigfoot on the brain. Now, another category is, is basically hoaxes. We have our pranksters. And everybody, everybody loves a good hoax, right? <laughs> and some folks have created amusingly elaborate costumes. And sometimes, people just lie about seeing Bigfoot. Sometimes, your brain and your gut tell you that the report is mendacious, which is a fancy described deception. And still other reports, they can be explained as a medical classification, albeit sensory limitation or an altered state. Now, I strongly suspect the reports of Bigfoot sightings will, will increase substantially wherever marijuana is legalized. <laughs> and finally, we have this, this unexplained category. So what about this 0.086%? <laughs> now, I cannot categorize, explain, or reckon to guess what happened in those instances. But after reviewing my fancy chart, I mean, I'm humble enough to say that I don't know everything, and maybe something is out there. So where does this leave us? This is just my experience. What will you take away from it? When presented with the unknown, will you jump to a conclusion, a preconceived notion, or will you embrace skepticism and let science be your guide? Is that a sunset, or are they putting the chariot away? Was that Bigfoot, or just another beaver? Science is a way of thinking much more than it's a body of knowledge. I really believe this. And this is the point right here. It's what those kids have that so many of us lose. A childlike curiosity that we could all use a lot more of. Who knows what Bigfoot is, if anything at all? After six years of looking, I haven't found it. But it's that unknown the unknown that spurs the curious and investigative little girl inside of me that grew into a scientist, a skeptical scientist. So I ask, please keep your ears, your eyes, your mind open too. And if you do happen to see Bigfoot, please give me a call. <laughs> Thanks, you guys.